ladies and gentlemen, that's Kendall Ramsour. Thank you very much, Kendall, for setting the tone tonight. I'm David Dower, Director of Artistic Programs at Arts Emerson. And I'm Sylvia Spears, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here at Emerson College. Uh, it's our great pleasure to uh, host this conversation here tonight. Uh, I just want to uh, do a quick bit of housekeeping. We always have to talk about the exits. In case of an emergency, please uh, locate this exit nearest you and move through it and away from the building. Uh, also, this production is taking this uh, conversation is taking place in the context of the Columbinus production that opened the Arts Emerson season, which is running at the uh, Black Box in the Paramount Center. And uh, I hope you'll take advantage of that as a continued part of the conversation if you haven't seen it already. And then on Saturday night, there's yet another opportunity to take advantage of uh, this conversation and extend it further. We're hosting a residency uh, for the Global Arts Corps who are here at work on a new piece based on the troubles in Northern <coughs> Ireland. Um, and their documentary film, A Truth in Translation, which is a film that they made of a, a play that they uh, created based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa that imagines the possibility of reconciliation and the uh, documentary tracks its tour of the world. So this month, uh, Arts Emerson is really uh, taking this conversation in many different directions. And it's really our honor to be um, hosting uh, this first event, uh, co-hosting with the Amalua Center, and I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Spears to describe uh, that part of the event. First of all, let me thank you all for gathering here this evening uh, to talk about gun violence and the disparities that we see and how it's covered in the media and how we react to those issues. I hope we will also consider what comes next this conversation. I'm especially pleased, though I must say, uh, that this event, this very important event, is the first event um, that the Elmer Lewis Center for Civic Engagement, Learning, and Research is hosting. We are most fortunate to be able to carry uh, Emmer, Elmer Lewis's name, which is an alum of our institution, class of 1943. She has, in her life, uh, done extraordinary work uh, in the city of Boston and around the country, um, finding ways for young people to be engaged, not just simply for altruistic endeavors in the arts, although they are wonderful, and I think uh, part of what cultivates humanity in all of us. But she had purpose in doing this. And that purpose was to show young people, especially in urban areas, another path, a path away from violence. So I'm so pleased uh, to have had some role in um, the development of the Ellen Mo Lewis Center and in the civic engagement initiatives at the college. We will continue to build upon those good works. It is also my pleasure to uh, work with and work for our president, uh, President Lee Helton, who's been an extraordinary leader uh, on this issue of gun violence and other issues that affect the lives of community members. It's my pleasure to introduce Lee Kelton. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I too want to extend my uh, gratitude to the Elmer Lewis Center for Civic Engagement, uh, Research, uh, and Learning, and to Arts Emerson for coming together this evening. And uh, it's just a wonderful uh, partnership around an issue that uh, is uh, compelling significant uh, to all of us. Let me give you a few facts. Uh, gun violence is the second leading cause of death uh, among young people up to the age of 19. And only crime killings uh, are um, that produce more deaths. 20,000 young people this year will be injured Almost 3,000 this year uh, will die uh, from gun violence. Uh, that's almost eight deaths uh, a year. Uh, 
half of those are uh, homicides, a third are suicides, and then uh, a large fraction uh, are accidents and deaths. This year, there will be more free school aid tables, free aid for school, that will die on the gun. So then there will be trained uh, board, uh, and trained uh, law enforcement this is a public health crisis uh, of enormous dimensions, the one that plays out uh, uh, every day, and especially uh, last week, as we recall, uh, inside the building uh, in ADR in Washington, D.C., uh, and in our own beloved city, there was a weekend where one person died and there was 805 separate shootings. The media, of course, plays a significant role in framing how we understand gun uh, violence and shootings in our nation, which are worthy of our attention, which are more tragic than others, which are worthy of a public response and a public outcry. At Emerson, how do we as artists and journalists and communicators frame social issues and cover, and cover tragedies in an equitable way? This evening's forum will examine these issues and the disparities uh, and the many complexities of gun violence. I'm very pleased that the Emily Finkel uh, is playing a pivotal and crucial role uh, in providing a venue for discourse about this issue. And I'm very pleased that Arts Emerson uh, has brought to us a riveting, uh, a riveting and compelling uh, production violence, which I would urge all of you uh, to see. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you the founding director of the Ellen Lewis Center, Kelly Bates, uh, who will moderate tonight's panel. Uh, at Emerson, Kelly will work with our campus to inspire and shape our civic engagement initiatives uh, and campaign in the, names, in the name of the great Elma Lewis, class of 1943. Before her and Emerson uh, Bates was the executive director of Access Strategies Fund, a charitable foundation that harnessing the collective power of underserved communities uh, to access democracy. Before that, she served as a national diversity consultant and trainer. She was a legislative advocate for the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute and the executive director of the Women's Statewide Legislative Network. She is a regular political commentator on WGBH television and radio. She's a recent recipient of the Boston NAACP Image Award and the Boston University College of Law Victor J. Darrow Public Service Award. She graduated from SUNY Albany uh, and a law degree from Boston University School of Law. And she has served as an adjunct professor at Tufts and Northeastern law schools. It is my uh, pleasure uh, and delight uh, to introduce to you tonight at this inaugural event, Kelly Bates. Good evening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, President Pelton, for that wonderful introduction um, and for really having the bright and powerful vision to bring a Center for Civic Engagement here to Emerson College. And in the name of a phenomenal arts educator, Elma Lewis, who, as I have been told, was a force to be reckoned with, was a great activist, and would be very proud that we all have gathered here this evening with our guests. Uh, some of you may know that Elma Lewis had great courage and great conviction. Um, I feel like our president exemplifies her legacy as well. He has taken very important and big stands against gun violence in our community, rallied college presidents all over the nation on this issue, and is really leading the way for us here at Emerson and in the broader community to say we want an end to violence and we will do our part as artists, as cultural makers and cult cultural brokers to say that we will be responsible in our reporting, we will be creative in our arts for healing, 
and we will be a part of the solution. I want to thank some people who have been such a great part of this event. First, I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening to our beautiful Majestic Theater. It is so wonderful to see you choose to be here with us this evening. I know you won't be disappointed in the power of this conversation. I want to thank Arts Emerson for initiating this panel and collaborating with the Elma Lewis Center. This is our first event, uh, and we're doing it jointly with them. I want to thank David Dower, who assembled this fantastic panel that you will have the privilege of being in a conversation with. And I want to thank Kevin Becerra and Akiba Acabalindo for handling all the outreach and logistics. It's just been an amazing team to work with. This panel, as some of you may know, is produced in conjunction with the uh, Arts Emerson presentation of Columbinus. I know David mentioned that. Um, I hope you get a chance and an opportunity to see it. I heard it's very profound and, and very powerful. I also wish to thank Sylvia Spears, who you met, our Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, Elaine Fiore and Suzanne Hinton, who also have been a great support to this event and to help launching the center. But I also want to thank those of us, um, many of you in the audience, who have been working so hard to put a spotlight locally on the issues of violence. There are many of you in this room, but I also want to particularly thank Kim Odom, Tina Cherry, Sarah Ann Shaw, and Jamal Crawford, and many others in this audience who really um, are experts themselves, unfortunately, either because they've lost loved ones to violence or because they have fought so vigorously to put a spotlight on the issue of violence, especially gun violence in our communities, and also held the media and all of us accountable to have this debate in a way that sheds the light on every angle of this issue. And I want to really appreciate HowlRound TV for live streaming this event so people who can't be with us can join us. And uh, if you have friends or know people who couldn't come, right after this program, they'll be able to hear the recording, which is just terrific. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, just a little context. Um, before we begin, as we all have discussed, you know, the shootings in D.C. Um, remind us of the importance of this issue. Um, not only that we need to get it right on gun control and mental health policy and economic security, um, but in fostering a society of peace, because that's, after all, what we're after. But I also think this week really reminds us of the profound role that race and class play in our perceptions of violence and the threat of violence. Some of you may have heard recently about a gentleman in North Carolina who was in a car accident, and he went to knock on the door of someone that he hoped would help him. And when he went to that door, the woman behind it thought that he was trying to intrude in her home. She called the police, the police came, and as he cried for help, they shot him 12 times. This is a very, very significant issue. Our perceptions around race, who are victims, who are perpetrators, how we as the media, as the public shape this debate, what stories don't get told, we have to give voice to that. And so part of what this evening is all about is giving a voice to forgotten stories and forgotten angles that need to be lifted up. I was reminded by my friend Jamal, there have been 138 shootings in Boston since the marathon, but you wouldn't know it if you followed the mainstream media. So tonight's event, we're going to look deeper, we're going to look harder at these issues, and we're going to figure out how, as a community together, all of us, Emerson, social justice organizations, students, staff, faculty, alumni, the world, how do we come together to put an end to this crisis? This is happening too often right here in our homes, right in Boston and in the nation. And we are in a unique position at Emerson, right, because we are teachers, and students of the media, we're the ones shaping public opinion, we're the artists that provide outlets and healing, and we have to re be responsible with our knowledge and our power and our influence around these conversations. It's not about everybody else, it's about us. What are we gonna do differently after tonight's panel? We are joined by five panelists that will give insight into this question, particularly of race and class dynamics with gun violence. And I think it's just going to be such a powerful, powerful evening. The way it's going to work is um, we're going to bring our panelists into the conversation first. But then after they're done, we're going to have mics at each end. Actually, you see them there. And we invite you to be a part of the conversation to ask questions, but also just to share your thoughts and your own perspectives. 
We'll have some comments and questions via Twitter, which will come in and we'll have them dialogue in the conversation. And I'm sure some of us will be willing to stay a little bit later and talk with you. And um, you know, so really, I'm, I'm glad you're here. This won't just be uh, talking heads. We'll all be together on this journey. And um, I want to start by introducing our panelists. And this is the first time I've ever had a panelist on a monitor. This gives a new name to talking heads um, here. Um, so you can't see him, but he is going to be on the screen in a moment. I want to first have you uh, recognize Philip Martin, who's just about to fill the screen. Um, Philip Martin has been a part of WGBH, and he's been reporting on human trafficking in southern New England, police training and race, the Occupy movement, many other topics. He's a regular panelist for Basic Black and an occasional panelist for Beat the Press. And he's the producer for Lifted Veils, which is a nonprofit public radio journalism project dedicated to exploring the issues that divide and unite society. He was NPR's first and only national race relations correspondent from 1998 to 2001. What you need to know about Philip is he's covered issues of violence very extensively. He covered uh, the tragic shooting of Sandy Hook students and adults in Newtown, Connecticut. He's in DC right now. Um, in memorials, given what is happening in the current news. So he's just going to be with us for 40 minutes on screen. Um, but we're just so glad to have you, Philip. I'm so glad you could join us via Skype. Can you hear us OK? That's Thank you, Kelly. I, I can indeed. I, I can indeed. Very important. Uh, All right, we may have a little delay on feedback, but we'll get that set up while I introduce the other panelists. To uh, Philip's left, I want to introduce you to Betty Scholes, who I spent an hour with yesterday and changed my life. She is a powerful advocate and activist based out of Denver, working with children in schools and in neighborhoods. But her story is one that's very profound. Her nephew, Isaiah Scholes, was killed in the tragedy at Columbine High School. And that really forced her in some ways to become a spokesperson for her family, speaking out against violence, bullying, and questionable practices in the media. She appeared in the documentary 13 Families, a film about how families and the 13 victims of the Columbine shootings cope with their loss. Um, she is an inspiration. Um, she is very powerful. And I know she's making her nephew very, very proud. To her left, we have Courtney Gray, who's become a fast friend. Uh, Courtney has been recognized for his work with victims of trauma and for his role of founder of Colombo Novo, a community of children and adults who use the Afro-Brazilian martial art from called Capoeira Angola, I hope I said that correctly, which is working to reduce violence and promote healing. He's also the director of trauma services at the Boston Public Health Commission. He's dealing with working with families and tragedies every day, and he provides so much assistance to them through the Commission's Office of Violence Prevention. He's a board member of Citizens for Safety, which is working to reduce the presence of illegal trafficking of guns. To his left is Taisha Akins who has also become a friend. Uh, Taisha is an activist. She's a Boston resident. She became a young mother at the age of 14, but as she says, managed to overcome all obstacles put in her way at such a young age. She's a product of a young teen mom, a victim of domestic violence, and a mother that lost her son and too many family members to gun violence. She has become a force for change to end violence and an inspiration to many. She's certainly an inspiration to me. I know she will be for you, too. To her left is Michael Patrick McDonald, who is the author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, All Souls, a family story from Southie, and the more recently acclaimed Easter Rising, a memoir of roots and rebellion. He's an activist who's focused on multicultural coalition building to reduce violence, and he's really worked on a grassroots level to gain more leadership from the community around the issues of gun violence. You may have heard of him. He's the founder of the Gun Buyback Program and local support groups which give voice to young people around issues of poverty, violence, and the drug trade. He's an author in residence at Northeastern University's Honors Program. He teaches writing and social justice issues and does a curriculum on conflict and peace with justice, which focuses on the north of Ireland. Please, please welcome them to Emerson College. to jump right in. Um, we're going to start having a conversation and I'll ask some questions. 
Um, and then we hope to get to you, the audience. So please think about what you are concerned about, what questions you have, and then we'll make sure you get a chance to enter in the conversation. I um, want to start with a question. You know, we, we talked a lot about what we wanted the focus of this evening to be. We've done a lot here at Emerson around gun violence. We're very committed to ending it. Um, the community has worked on this issue for way too long. But we wanted to look at the race and class dynamics. And I wanted to ask our panelists, what, what do you see as sort of the key disparities in how the media and society view violence, especially when you look at white communities and communities of color, uh, suburbia and urban? Um, what is your experience? And I'm, I'm going to start with Philip and then go to Courtney. But then I really want to focus on hearing from the families who have been affected examples of how your family was treated. I think it's important for the audience and for us to understand what happens when violence occurs and how issues are treated, especially around race and around people's perceptions of race. Philip, let's start with you. You have a lot of experience uh, in the media, on GBH, you covered uh, Sandy Hook. What, what do you see? Well, well, Kelly, I think, yeah, first of all, uh, I'm not sure how bad this echo is. Uh, I'm hearing it quite a bit on my side, but I'm not going to get through this. Uh, when you think of something like Sandy and you think about violence oh, Philip, in I'm Africa. Oh, Philip, I'm sorry to cut you off, Philip. We, we're still getting a little bit of an echo effect. We can't hear you too well. So we, we're having some technical difficulties. But in the meantime, <clears throat> we'll have Courtney address this question, and we'll come right back to you, Philip. Thank you. All right, so I think the most important thing I noticed is that people are feeling, residents, those that are directly affected by this incident are feeling that when there's an act of violence, it's almost normalized that certain populations are exposed to violence and will die or be victims of violence. And sometimes it's the perception that, the, that they're almost meant to have this experience. So I, might, I as a, even as a provider might be less surprised if, if a non-black person was shot because of the prevalence. And what we find is that when media discusses it, there might be a different slant of the way a story might be, a story might be told. Now, I want to stop here for a second and say I'm telling the stories of others because I'm not a direct victim myself, but some people like Taisha here I've only met through doing the work. So I'm really speaking about what I've, se I've sensed from them when incidents happen, especially right afterwards, when someone is at the worst moment of their life. Imagine never being in a paper before and then seeing your family's life in the paper, told with whatever someone can gather in a short amount of time about the life of this person who's passed away. And often we will talk from a deficit standpoint. Um, we will talk about what things led to that, what, what crime or what kind of behavior led to that incident, as opposed to saying that person was also an honor roll student, that person was, um, just got into college, that person was an, uh, a prolific dancer or poet. And these are the, so, 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 sort of like, are they telling the whole story of someone's life as we present that in the newspaper or television? Thank you, Philip. I think we've got you back online. Let's try it again. Okay, let's see. Let's see. I'm not sure. Well, uh, maybe if I back a little bit. No. Uh, not working. <laughs> I think it's really an audio problem. I'm so sorry, Philip. We'll see what we can do. I'll I appreciate keep coming it. back to you, and we'll, we'll figure it out. Thank you. Um, hold that thought. We're gonna get in, um, Betty. Betty, would you share with us from your own personal vantage point what your experience was? And give us a sense of your nephew, what it was like before Columbine for him, what it was like during and the aftermath, especially with regard to race and the treatment of race in that issue. Uh, Isaiah was a lovable person. He, well, he was a victim of bullying in school. He was the only black child at Columbine High School. Uh, the name calling, the shoving, the hitting <clears throat> was ignored, even when reported. Isaiah endured because he was taught that to stand and to pray for the best. Isaiah was a spiritual child and he believed there, there is good in everybody and that love could solve the problems. If he would treat everybody as he wanted to be treated, that they would change. And in most cases, it happened. You know, he, he was like, he joked all the time and compensated for the hurt. Uh, 
the adults, the educators in the school ignored these signs. For many years, they ignored the signs of the trouble with the other kids and with Isaiah. Uh, when we reported that the bullying was going on in threats, uh, the quote was from the principal, we do not have this in the school. So to further his education, we endured it. I regret I didn't step up as I do now and fight for Isaiah. I would tell him the same thing I told him in the past when he first announced to me that the troubles he was having, no matter what you do, you're gonna continue to love. And we are commanded to love our neighbors as we do ourselves. So first of all, I think we need to step up and tell the truth when the truth is there for you to be seen instead of hiding in corners and, and, and telling the stories as you want society to hear. Uh, the story of Isaiah is just now getting out because society do not want to hear that kids are actually being good kids good students, and there's still problems. There's still the racial bias in our society today. We have to face the problem and adjust to that. We cannot keep ignoring it. Are we gonna continue to have this violence in our country? It's, it's, it has gotten to the point that I have visited nearly every tragedy in prayer. That's what I take with me, is prayer and love. And I think that would be the change. Betty, you, you shared with me yesterday uh, about that day. Um, do you want to say more about what you know about that and what the media didn't report, what you want us to know about that day? Uh, that day, I said, uh, first of all, I had trouble getting into the school because of my race. I was held back. I had to initially fight my way in. That day, Isaiah was killed. Kids was coming to us, telling us that he was targeted, and before he died, he was called a nigger. He was targeted, and he was found, and there is that nigger, because it was intentionally that they went in to find him. And the last words he had heard in his life was, nigger, let's kill that nigger, we found that nigger. So could you imagine saying bye to your loved one with that on your mind? And my truth is to stop, never have another kid in school be taunted like that and be killed useless. And we need to stop glorifying these killings, in my opinion, and uh, trying to give society what it wants to hear instead of telling the truth and focus on the real victims. Thank you, Betty. Taisha, your, your story, if you'd be willing to share. Well, my son, um, he was 17. He was murdered right in front of his brother. Um, it was a horrible day for me. I usually that one particular son I usually keep with me all the time. Um, and for one moment, my son finally, in my eyes, matured and was able to be on his own. And less than 10 minutes of me leaving my son, I got a phone call that he was, he was murdered. Um, it, it was a tough time because not only was one of my sons murdered, it affected both of my other children. It, um, and the way that it was handled was very disturbing. Um, his brother was arrested as a, like a suspect. They dropped my son off in front of my house with no shoes, no pants. Um, the police used to tell us, tell me that I was a bad mother. Um, 
I was raising kids that were out of order, and I was just tormented. I, I had to move off my street. When my, after my son was murdered, they broadcasted all of my information on news reports, um, my address, which I felt as though endangered my, my other two children. Um, it's so much, I'm trying not to cry, I'm sorry. Remember, I told you, it's okay. And it's okay. I think the way that my son was labeled, it's like, in, in the African American culture, the communities, you can move on the street with a black male son, and they're already labeled as being a gang member from that area. You can't walk anywhere without this stereotype on these black young men out here. It doesn't matter where they are, where they go, they're always labeled as a gang member because of you know, how they dress, and that's how they looked at my son. He was well known to the police as they labeled him. They failed to say that he came from a, a loving family, that he was very important to my household. He played a very important position in my life, um, that he was still somebody's child. And it's just, it's just a lot. I still deal with it to this day with my other son, so it's an ongoing situation. It, it wasn't stopped when my son was murdered. I still have to deal with my other son being labeled. Um, I have to deal with the pressure from the streets. It's, it's a lot. It's just, it's it, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna stop for a second. Okay, thank you, Taisha. Michael? Um, I became an activist in um, 1990 and community organizer throughout the 90s, but that year when I first became an activist, that was a year when uh, Boston saw uh, its highest uh, number of homicides in the city. And uh, coming from South Boston, coming from the Old Colony Housing Project, family of 11 kids, having, I lost four siblings to the effects of uh, poverty, three of them violently. Um, two of them were involved in the streets. My mother was shot while washing dishes uh, one night from a stray bullet that came through the window. And uh, a lot of neighbors in those years were, were um, dying, throughout the 80s especially. Um, in the 90s, a lot of that was uh, quieted down by more organized crime than we had in the earlier 80s. But in, the, uh, in this period, 80s, 90s, and well into the 2000s, um, until very recently, South Boston held the country's highest concentration of white poverty. And uh, growing up in this neighborhood and having lost so many siblings and seeing so many neighbors uh, dying um, and nobody talking about it, whether inside the community or the world outside the community, the, in the media, it was never being reported on either. Um, I knew that I needed to work on this stuff, that I needed to talk about this stuff, and so in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, in Boston's black and Latino neighborhoods, there was a strong tradition of activism. And so once in a while you would see, especially after the Charles Stewart case, you saw a lot of um, people on television saying all the words that we couldn't say in our neighborhood. Um, the words that, we're, you know, that we couldn't say due to a code of silence, uh, whether, whether it was crime, violence, drugs, guns, or even just to talk about poverty. So I knew I had to go over over there, I knew I had to cross the bridge and, and go across town. And in the following years, I met some of the best friends of my life and worked with a lot of survivors um, who uh, were activated and involved in the, uh, in the movement against violence in the streets. And one of our first efforts, I mean, getting to know people across town, um, there was so much in common. And, and that was the thing, I just saw so many things in common that we were never really allowed to realize we had in common all those years, the kind of reporting, like South the only got reported about if there was or racism, if there was a racist uh, incident that happened there. But um, any of the victims of the, the drug trade or violence throughout the years we recently heard about through the Whitey Bulgy years were never reported on. And across town, of course, people 
had some of the same situation where the victims lives their true stories who they really were was never really being reported on what would be reported on in the black and latino communities would be this whole notion of of the the super predator so so uh, this stuff would be reported on when we could talk about the black perpetrator but not when we talk about the black victim but never reported on like never we would never talk about who these young people were that were dying um, in those communities, uh, mostly. In Southie, we wouldn't hear about uh, the victims of any of the stuff that was happening. People, for the most part, throughout the city of Boston didn't really know about this stuff happening in places like Southie and Charlestown, another poor Irish American community with uh, the country's highest rate of unsolved murders in this time, at that time. Um, so you, you really didn't hear about any of that stuff. And what was always really, uh, what angered me a lot was here we would, you know, that the media was more than willing to talk about the black super predator, you know, some 15-year-old kid usually is what they were referring to. And we had Whitey Bulger and nobody was talking about that super predator. So there was a, you know, it was, it was actually to our detriment that that wasn't being talked about at all um, in the media and not, not being reported on as well. Um, because we had a real super predator, an adult who, who and not just him, but his, all of his networks, all the people that worked with him, a lot of people in law enforcement at all levels of law enforcement who are preying upon young people in an incredibly poor, vulnerable population of single-parent female-headed households in the lower end of South Boston. 75% single-parent female-headed households. And none of that was ever being reported on. It, it took this many years for all of it to come out. I mean, you know, after all souls, it started to come out more and more. And then uh, culminating this summer with the trial of, of Whitey Bulger. Um, so, it's, it's just, there's a lot of nuance here and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of different ways that it's reported about in different communities. Uh, there's definitely the class element. Uh, these days we see a disproportionate um, uh, amount of uh, heroin and OxyContin uh, overdoses in places like South Boston. Even though South is half gentrified at this point, half yuppified, you still have a very, very disproportionate uh, percentage of uh, overdoses. And that's always, those kids are kind of written off too. Um, and, and that's not really reported on. And of course, suicide is, a, is another issue, but people have to be careful about that. So there's a lot of nuance with this that I think involves race and class, but what's particularly evident is that when this stuff happens in the black community, we are more than willing to, uh, to depict in the media, on television, news, movies, and so forth, uh, the black perpetrator, and not really exactly what you said, um, Aisha, about your son, like who was this child, who he really was, who he was in the home, what he meant to us. And one of the first, one of the first efforts we did uh, before the gun buyback program in Boston, we were trying to promote the leadership from the survivor community and to bring together a survivor community that was black, white, Latino, Asian at the forefront. Mothers from Charlestown and Southie, as well as Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. And this was the first time Tina Cherry came out, um, who's the mother of Louis D. Brown. We held a, uh, we, we did an exhibit that we were gonna put right in the lobby of City Hall. We got the approval of City Hall to put an exhibit with, where we enlarged all the faces of these young people throughout the city who had died from gun violence and then a, a little bit about who they were. We got from their families, you know, the kind of things that you just said about your son, who he was in the family. And so when you walked into City Hall, you saw these kids that nobody's ever really paid attention to blown up bigger than life and a little bit about who they were. And it was, what was amazing about that was that it was the beginning of a survivor movement. And I have to say that that's one of the biggest difference I've seen too, is the, the victims whose names we know, um, oftentimes it's because the survivors won't let us forget uh, their names. And that's a good thing. I mean, I think most people in Boston, a lot of young people in the Boston public schools know who Louis D. Brown is, and that's because of the work of Tina Cherry. And so many survivors, like the people on the panel here, have that power. Thank you, Michael. Philip, you've been so patient. I hope you work out this time. Can you, can you say a few words for us? Yeah, I hope it, I hope it works, too. <laughs> um, is there, I think there's still an echo, is there not? Try again. OK, let's try, try it again. If I can see things. And I'm going to talk a few words regardless. I think there's a hierarchy of how we violence society and how we, without question. Sorry, Philip, we're still not getting you in. I uh, apologize. 
Well, no, thank you. I know, well, but we, we will make sure we figure out a way to bring you back here and get I, your perspective. I appreciate it, and so to, to the network and to the audience. All right, thank you, Philip. Can we thank, thank you. Philip? He tried. He tried. <laughs> Some technology works, sometimes it doesn't, but we thank you for your time, Philip, and please, um, please keep doing the good work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, let Thank me you. ask specifically, I heard a little bit from each of you, but if you could have lifted a little more, how the media treated you. Um, there are some examples about, a little bit more examples about how reporters treated you, what your experience was like with them, or what you've seen with other families. Um, do you feel like you're treated any differently than maybe um, others, whites, for example, or um, what you see on TV in, in suburban communities? Did it feel different for you? Taisha, did you want to weigh in on that? Well, I definitely feel that being black, you get treated definitely different from the um, white communities. Um, the day after my son was murdered, I had the media banging down my door. They wouldn't take no for an answer. I found that to be very inconsiderate, disrespectful. Um, I remember them asking me, can we get a story about your son? But because of what was already written out there in the media, I refused it. And they was persistent. They kept asking for a picture. I literally had to kick them off of my property. Um, I feel like the way that they word our kids in the media is discouraging. Um, usually in the media, you would think that they would encourage people to come forth, which I know they do at times, but the way that they label these kids and describe these kids in the paper like they did my son, to me felt like because they said he was well known to the police or um, he, had, he was a bad child or whatever the case may be, I felt like that was discouraging to some people that may have had answers. Um, it kind of labeled him as being a problem child, and I think that changes the points of view or the opinions of others reading the articles. Um, I think that they, um, well, I don't even think I know that they, they label the people in our community all the time as being less than, um, or it kind of makes it seem like we're not worthy either because of our color or because of our financial situation that we don't get the same privileges or the same resources as the white communities. I've often heard people say, uh, you know, we were already victimized and then the media victimized us again. So it's like a double victimization, one layer on top of the other. Betty, I see you trying to come yes. in. Yes. Um, Isaiah was raised in the suburbs in a better neighborhood because my brother and me, myself, uh, had decided that we would send our kids to the better schools. I don't know about here, but in Colorado, the school systems are supposed to be the same, but in the suburbs, the schools has the better lunches, the better teachers, uh, the better snacks. They provided with snacks, uh, soft drinks, and everything. Uh, the school books and uh, courses. They have college courses in high school. So uh, our kids was always sent to school in the suburbs. So when this happened, I moved to another suburb, which I sent my grandkids. So, and they are treated as if they lived in the inner city. So uh, the different areas do not count. It could be inner city, the suburbs, or whatever. All black kids are being treated disrespectful, uh, discouraged, so they don't graduate high school. So I saw the treatment my grandkids had out there in the suburbs, in the newer neighborhood. I took them there. 
my grandsons, two of my grandsons, was hit by a driver that ran a red light. And the officer tried to ticket my grandson for jaywalking. So at that point, and this was shortly after Columbine, at that point in time, I said, I refuse. They have easy access to my children in the suburbs. So we moved back in the inner city, you know, so they could have a better chance, even if they was targeted as a black child. Because of the area, it don't matter. It don't matter, they're gonna be treated differently. The media is gonna carry it any way they want to. They're gonna victimize the victim and glorify the assailant. And this is the problem now, see, because uh, that's, as I see, that's what's happening now with all the tragedies. They seek affection and attention, and the media gives them that so they continue to kill. And, you know, and with the black youth, it's the same thing. They want to hear the bad part, so they, they give the audience what they want. So that's the problem right now, and that's why they, they don't look at your child's life. And that's point blank. I have had several years experience. I'm out here, I'm walking in schools, I'm fighting in schools every day on a daily basis because I walk in a school. And with me walking into some of the schools in Colorado, it's unbearable. Kids are being called names. Kids are being pushed. Educators are sitting there looking at it. Nobody's speaking up. The problem with us right now, we're not speaking up. There's different angles we can go to do everything we can. We gotta stop this. We gotta stop that. My kids are not graduating high school because they see no future. We, we sit around here and we complain and we have to do something. We have to get up and fight. And, and all of us together, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that we're separating race. It shouldn't even be that. It shouldn't, if you have heart in your, I mean, if you have love in your heart, it shouldn't even be that. You shouldn't even pass one child and see that they're hurting without stopping and seeing what you can do. It takes a whole nation, and until we do that, we're not gonna succeed. We're not gonna graduate the kids. We're not gonna have the successful life we, we expected as Americans. I'm sorry to say, but that's how I truly feel. You know, one of the things, Betty, you shared with me yesterday, you know, we were talking about sort of the mistreatment of these issues in the media, the lack of coverage and what it is covered, the blame the victim coverage, right? You did talk about, though, one person in the media, though, that you felt did hear you and did share part of the story. I think it would be really helpful for us to hear about that. What was it about? that particular person, that interaction, that you think is a model, especially for those of us who are in journalism. Um, tell us about that person and, and what that person meant to you and how they were supported. Uh, the day, the next day after Isaiah was killed, there was hundreds of reporters on the line. I mean, all up in the windows, everywhere. So I walk outside because my heart, I was taking snacks out. <laughs> And that's the way I am. I, I was taking snacks out, drinks, sodas, and they was rushing, trying to get stories, you know, rushing up and just getting me all excited and upset. And it was one lady walked up to me and said, how your family is doing? So I said, everybody leave. I said, you come with me. You, and so I took her in the hot house. <laughs> And uh, she became my friend because I, it was hard felt that she cared about the way I was feeling and my family. So I kept her in the house all day. She got the whole insights, stories. Everywhere I went, I took her with me because I felt comfortable with her. And she was true to heart. I mean, the first impression you make on a person is is that everlasting impression. You're gonna have to go full hearted to that person if you want the story and want it come correctly. You can't approach a person 
and they know you're gonna be a phony from the beginning to the end. You're not gonna give the real story. You're gonna give the story that uh, the world wants to hear. In uh, Isaiah's uh, instance, the story wasn't told until uh, my friend, I'm not gonna give her name because she's not here and it's not a privilege, but she knows who she is. Uh, she was able to get a real story because she was a real person. You have to uh, be yourselves and give your heart if you want the inside story of any story. That's nice. Thank you. Courtney and Michael, would you like to weigh in on hearing support for that? Well, I, I'm really glad we ended on this point because as sitting up here, I kept thinking, okay, when we say the media, we're talking about an institution, but there are humans in that institution and they're not homogeneous. In fact, Phil is a journalist, so there are different roles and different people. So I've had examples where people were very heartfelt, where they did the appropriate thing and even helped situations, like became human beings and helped on the scene. Not just the bombing, not just when we had people from Katrina at Otis Air Force Base, but also in micro-incidents of homicide and suicide. Um, so I, it's, it's interesting that we should think about like how they really play things out. But I also want to pull back and say, I'm actually stunned that Emerson is holding this conversation today. Um, as somebody who's been doing this work with folks and with victims, uh, I'm very pleased that an arts institution is having a complicated and um, almost a real I actually think it's, a, it's worth a moment of applause that, are y'all gonna give a moment? Uh, and, 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 and some of us that try to protect and serve people that are affected by negative things, we've been waiting almost for the arts institutions and other institutions. And, and Emerson's also an educational institution, so um, a, new, a new voice, a new force with a new intention and, and paradigm for looking at things. So I'm really appreciative of this conversation. So um, I'm contemplating many things. One is like, who tells our story? Like, who's actually gonna be the one to tell the story? If it's media, that's one thing. And if it's not um, investigative media like Philip does, if it's, if it's just telling the story of the moment, we might get the story told with a slant. But, uh, but fortunately enough, people are telling their own stories sometimes through arts, and there's also a culture of journalists that are saying for themselves that they want to change the paradigm of how people report on trauma, report on violence, report on sudden death. It's led by journalists, so hopefully before the talk is over, we might talk about things we can do as arts, as, as artists and people in the arts community that will shift this. Um, but I do have a story to tell about, a, an example of me gathering a lot of stories. It was when I was doing research for Boston Medical Center with the National Institute of Mental Health grant. And I have to say, being a black man, I think I learned how to be a black man through this study, or learned more about how to be one, because I was interviewing and studying people who were admitted to the hospital, sometimes hours after they were admitted, or within a week or so, and then following them for three months with some very extensive interviews with some very probing questions. And I was shocked with what I heard. I heard about, because we're really talking about racism as well as media. And, and whether or not there's structural racism, whether or not someone treats me in a racist way or not, is the system set up for me to be in a negative place? So why are there more poor people in certain neighborhoods? Why are more some races affected negatively by health conditions? And that's our work at the commission. So with 130 men that followed over three years, a month, uh, three months apiece, we heard stories of what they're carrying and also how they were treated at the moment that they were almost like your, your nephew's experience being hit by cars. And it's odd because I had an opinion of who got shot in America and what they looked like and what their lives were like. Um, I graduated from MIT and I was surprised how many MIT students might have been shot or college students who, you know, when we did the interview, we knew exactly they were getting really great grades, they were studying really hard, but they went to a party. Like I went to many parties when I was in college at a certain, in a certain neighborhood and something happened in that neighborhood and I got injured by a stray bullet. Yet the system would speak to me as if I were somebody who knew what, is, what, what kind of gun I was shot with, questions that I would never even conceive, even asking myself while I'm injured, because I'm only thinking, how do I use my life's resources to stay alive? Yet I'm asking questions, being asked questions about like what kind of gun you know, was, I was shot with because they think I'm a gang member. And these are people who I think, in their own minds, believe they're doing the right thing and think that they're, they're great folks. So the question is, how does the media help us tell a complete story, and is there that intention? And I think so another question that, that is just brought to bear is, and what, again, what we can do, because I, I, I feel a little bit sad that mothers who have gone through the worst thing in their life have to muster up additional energy to advocate for themselves. Uh, at the commission, we say we arrive to support people in their worst moments. So if, if 121 people, whatever the number is since the bombing, if that many people died of HIV or died of 
hepatitis or diabetes, we would show up and say, what are we gonna do about this? How are we gonna serve it? It would be a story in the paper in itself. Um, so the question is, how are we gonna help with this particular situation? Michael, do you have a perspective in answering that question? Um, what do you think can be done? Um, and you know, I know you have actually done some multiracial cross-coalition work. Have you seen positive instances where the media has done a good job or where the arts community has played a powerful role in shaping the message in, in ways that are complete and ways that cover different angles in the full story? Have you seen that? Have we gotten there? And, and if we haven't, what, what, what can we do? I mean, this is a group of people who wants it to be different. I, I'm glad that uh, Philip is at least here in spirit. I know. <laughs> he's a, you know, for everybody who doesn't know him, he's an incredible person, first, journalist, second. Uh, he's a great journalist, but he's just an incredible, empathic person, and I think that's the key. I think that's what you were getting at with the reporter that you connected with. She had empathy, she had, she was in touch with her own humanity and therefore yes. in touch with yours. That's how it works. And I think that's the key is that empathy. And, uh, you know, across all of the supposed boundaries of, of race and class and all, all that, we have to have empathy. We all care about the people who um, are killed in mass murders in the in, uh, more upper middle class suburbs. We care about the, uh, the Boston Marathon victims. And this has to happen in all directions. The idea that all of these children are all of our children, all of them in all directions. So I think that that is an empathy that really comes from being in touch with your own um, your own pain and your own human humanity. Uh, Philip was probably one of I was at the Whitey Bulger trials all summer, and I, um, Philip was one of the very few African American um, journalists in the media room. I was in the media room, and um, Philip wrote about uh, the stuff that had happened in my community in a way that uh, nobody else uh, really did because he was the one person that I noticed who didn't write about that stuff in, in the kind of gratuitous, titillating, gangster, pornographic way that a lot of people do. Um, he didn't use words like, he didn't talk about people getting whacked and stuff like that and thinking that's cute. Um, trying to be, you know, to, trying to be gritty for the sake of being gritty. Um, Philip writes from the heart, so uh, not just because, well, he's not even here, so <laughs> I can say this behind his back. But he's just, he's the, he's the example of what we need more of. But it's not just about, um, it's not just about the journalists telling our stories. I think that's key, what Courtney said, is how are we gonna tell our stories? And I was very fortunate to, to go that direction with memoir. A lot of times when I was working as an activist, a lot of the media wanted to um, tell my family's story. And, and we would use that as activists. We would hold a press conference for the gun buyback. We all got up there as survivors. We told our stories for a greater good. And, but you could only tell so much and then they could do, you know, they can cut it up in ways that they cut it up. And that's when I decided, you know, I need to tell this story and be totally in control of it, of, the, of, of my truth, of my story and how I see this whole, and, and really the story for me wasn't about what happened to us and it's not me, me, me. It's about the bigger picture of race and class. And that's what I wanted to get to because the media wasn't gonna talk about that stuff. Do, do you all think social media has changed this? I mean. You know, I think in the situation of Trayvon, mm -hmm. that was such a, an example of people controlling the message and just everybody getting involved in that conversation. I, it makes me wonder, if social media wasn't here, would that have that, 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 that fierce support? I love social would media. Would that have happened? I, I, I love curious. social media, but it has to happen in more than 42 characters. This telling of our stories has to happen in more than 42 characters. It's the new soundbite, you know? Um, and, I, and not just in, in writing, as Courtney said, I mean, in dance, in performance, in theater, there's so many ways that we have to tell our stories. And it's amazing, as he said also, that this, is, this conversation is happening at an arts organization. I think that's where we can bring this. Uh, I have something to say. Uh, when Isaiah was killed, nobody at the school knew anything about Isaiah. It, only his friends, a couple of friends he had. Uh, they went for months on top of months without saying his activities, what he loved, anything about his life. Then finally I stepped up and, and um, one reporter asked me, and that was my friend, what, 
did Isaiah like? What was he like? What did he enjoy doing? And it was so hurtful because in a school that large, even his teachers didn't know anything about him. All they knew about him was he was that black kid. So to say our kids are ignored, we have to stop and do something about getting attention to those children because they deserve to be known. They deserve to have their achievements known and to be built up with them, within them. Society has labeled the kids as failures. The media has labeled our kids as failures. Uh, when I look at a group of kids, I see scientists, I see doctors, I see lawyers. When I step up to a principal at a school, I see failures, I see a potential gang member, is what they tell me. So until we can feel the pain and continue on with the fight and to get the diversity out, it's gonna continue there. The media is gonna go tart, whatever sounds good. And that's not right. We have to get to the heart of the problem, get to know the victims, and get to know that there's victims that actually are victim kids, as Trayvon. There are kids that's been murdered every day that's innocent. And get out to the world. These kids are loved by someone. They're someone's children. And as I was labeled one day about police officers, and they continue to try to label me because I'm the troublemaker. I will step into a school board meeting. I will step up uh, to the administration. I will step up until I get some improvement done. I'm in a fight now with uh, public schools in Colorado. But until somebody takes a stand, it was, will continue to fail the system and then there it goes the, the killers and whatever you want to label them. But the media has a lot to do with that. You have to stop glorifying the crime. And that's the bottom line. That's our problem. In each one of the tragedies I have stepped into and known, that person who did the killing wanted attention, wanted love. When if our society start giving them the attention, start reporting the wrongs, and I believe there will come an end to all this. It's not going to end with us sitting here and not doing anything. Report that people is gone without medical help. They need to go see a psychiatrist. Report when you see that. Report that the school is mistreating the kids. Report when you see a police officer, you know. That's what you're supposed to do. As a citizen, you're not supposed to sit up and be quiet and see trouble. You're not supposed to report what the world wants to see, report what your job is, the truth. As a, as a citizen, I expect the media to give me the truth. That's what you expect from the reporters and the newspapers. I want to know the truth of the story. I don't want the feel-good version of a story, and that's the media, in my opinion, stray every incident to what they want to believe, and it's not supposed to be a personal item. Let me just shift this for a moment. Last question, because I really want to leave time for us to interact with the audience. Let's talk, we talked a lot about the media. I want to talk about the role of the arts, the role of artists in shaping this issue or in helping with healing. I wonder if any of you can point to examples where the artist community, the cultural community has played a role in helping to put a spotlight on this issue in ways that have been helpful. Are there examples, things that you remember, whether it was performance or music or poetry or in that case there was an exhibit, Michael, you talked about that you really felt changed the way people saw the issue. What have you seen and what would you say to us, both as you know, an artistic community, as, as activists, you know, what, what role can we play? Sometimes you feel like, well, what if I don't know the issue well? Or also, you don't want to exploit families. You know, I heard from many of you um, what happens to families. I, I got a great idea, let me come do this. You know, and sometimes that's not what you need. <laughs> um, 
So does anybody want to speak to that, the role that artists can play or role, role the arts have played in your lives or in the healing process or in changing this issue? What is the play that's going on? I, I, I have three quick examples. One happened on this stage when Phelan Musical was here. Um, uh, there's a scene where there's a, about this, the main character's uh, death, a pretty big death that affected the whole community, and they were coming through the aisles with many caskets here. And in the later run of the show, they started adding names to the side of the caskets, and they would stack them up on stage as part of the procession. And then after just adding the concepts like justice, peace, forgiveness, like some of the Peace Institute's mantras, um, they started putting the names of victims, and in one run of the show, they put the word Trayvon. And, and literally, as they see the names, the audience is roaring, roaring with, with applause and, and heart. And when they put Trayvon in one of, the, one of the runs of the show, which wasn't on this stage, Trayvon's mom was in the audience. And they stopped the show and acknowledged her. So this is where the art is being related to real life. Another scenario is uh, there was a dancer, a, a really good like, urban dancer, who was well known, who was injured uh, fatally. And at the repass, instead of it being sort of uh, just completely solemn, uh, solemn, there were about 15 dance performances and people were celebrating. So these people identified themselves as artists. So artists were claiming how they made meaning of, uh, of death ritual. Uh, and then another funeral, which was a very hard one, I don't want to say names because there might be people in the audience. After the repass and people were back in front of the house, I watched five young men interpret their feelings. So they didn't speak to anyone the whole time. But on the street corner, I saw them go through about two hours worth of exchange interpretive dance where they were communicating with one another. Um, so one of the things I always ask for the arts community to do is, is bring, uh, help us get access to becoming artists again. Because we come from cultures where every single person was considered an artist. And it's the making of the art that, that we need to look at in addition to the presentation of the art. So give me poetry, give me spoken word, give me theater so I can express myself, tell my own story to myself when I'm alone by myself. The last one is a, an actual news outlet helped hold an exhibit similar to the one at City Hall, which was called Anonymous Boston. And they weren't just talking about the media, this was a media related exhibit, not just about the media, but the culture of the people who are, are in that paradigm for that particular news outlet. And so they had articles of people who were shot and the comments, the anonymous comments that people, people were making were hurtful. Like one less welfare baby to feed, these really harsh comments that people would see. So this exhibit put up different stories, stories told by the family members, very huge exhibits as well, and portraits of all the victims, and then ceremony and conversation and dialogue with artists, with media in particular as well, about the issue of violence and the roles we can play. So these are just various examples. Those are great. But it's really about just becoming a citizen of the city you are in and engaging people in arts in all those different ways. Uh, we'll take uh, one more comment and um We'll bring it into the audience, but I'm going to have you all add in as we go. So this is not the end of the conversation at all. Taisha, did you want to add anything specific? Well, it might be a little off topic, but I think um, art and entertainment is good because that's what this generation is really focused on. They look at the videos. They're watching everything on TV, be glorified, the, the drugs, the killing. Um, it's one thing for all of us to be in here collectively to try to do something about the situation, but I think the core of the problem is getting these, this particular population in a building and getting to them. Because these are, the, these are the children that are committing these crimes, these are the children that are angry, and I think getting to the bottom of their anger and why they are so angry and what is the cause of them acting out in this way is important. Um, I can speak to you, I can speak to Courtney, but I think hands on with the actual perpetrators out here in these streets is what's really important to me. I don't go, this is my first time publicly speaking on this, but I don't go to a lot of meetings and what I do is that particular population that we consider the gang bangers or the violent people, I embrace them. Um, and I noticed that a lot of them are angry because they had they have no father figure in their life. Um, a lot of it is financial situations, um, a single mother struggling, 
and these kids are angry and they're gonna do anything to either provide for their family or to take their anger out in some way. And I just think we need to get them in like this audience and let them have a visual of how they're affecting us, their parents, and everybody else that's involved with the crimes. It's not just me that's hurting. I have friends that are my support system that I'm like a strain on them. They support me as well as having to deal with their own families. So it's just not me that's the victim. It's the people around me as well. And I just think getting to the bottom of the, of the situation, you really have to get into these people's heads and what's going on with them. Before we go to the audience, I was just going to ask you that. Um, before we go to the audience, can we just applause and thank them for their comments and perspectives so far? It was very powerful. Thank you. What I'd like us to do now is bring you up into the conversation and uh, the way I'd like to do that is very shortly I'll ask people to feel comfortable and come down to the mics, don't be shy. So if you're feeling the need to comment or a question, start making your way. Um, but at this moment, at this break, I just want to acknowledge if we have uh, folks in the room who have been fighting hard in the community to end gun violence, and no matter at what level, either you've been a family that's affected or you're part of social justice groups or artists that have played a role in this issue, would you just please stand so we could acknowledge your advocacy and your commitment to these issues? Don't be shy. Please stand up. Can we please give them a hand? We, we know you could be up here too, and I hope you'll join in the conversation. Um, so let's go, we're gonna bounce around. Let's start over here. Say your name and feel free to say whatever you need to say. You don't have to pose a question, by the way. I sometimes find that very frustrating. You really want to say something. You can just okay, say something. so yes, I definitely want to say something. Hi, my name is Cindy Diggs, and I'm the founder of Peace Boston, which is a hip-hop peace movement that was started um, eight years ago by members of the hip-hop community. And we find that we have played can a major try role. something different? Would sure. You turn that mic around a little bit so you're facing the audience. Oh. Because you know what? It's not about us. It's about us. Hi. Go right in. <laughs> they want to see you. Okay, so um, eight years ago, we started this peace movement, which we thought was going to be a one-day event, um, when four young men were killed in the studio in Dorchester. And I worked with a hip-hop clothing uh, designer to create the Start Peace t-shirt, and the movement just went from there. Uh, we went on to produce a Peace in the Streets album, the Start Peace t-shirt, um, and we donated money from those different projects towards um, either youth activities or um, to a burial fund. And we have had several groups working with us that we created, the Recording Artists for Peace, the Greeks for Peace, Stylists for Peace, and DJs for Peace. And now we're working um, with Bakers to do a fundraiser. We've formed a, a, an alliance with all of the people that do peace work and social justice work and anti-violence work. And just using the arts, we put on a lot of shows and in the middle of the event, we'll stop the event and talk about peace because we have a captive audience of young people to spread that message to them. So the arts is very important. And to tell you, um, Emerson's school color is purple and that's the color of peace, so I'm glad that you are on board with us and we will definitely be reaching out to you to collaborate with you. I know Akiba very well from when she was a young person and I was a community producer at the Strand Theater. So we're all in this together and we've, like I said, just started this peace collaborative with a number of the people that you mentioned that helped you to organize this. So Peace Boston is definitely wanting to help you. And peace, Courtney, my hip hop brother. <laughs> Great, thank you. Let's jump over here. Turn the mic around, let's see you. Join, join everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hi, um, my name's Sheba. I'm a freshman theater education major here at Emerson. Um, yay, there are other ones, this is so exciting. Um, 
what I wanted to say is I actually, I'm from Boston, I'm from Dorchester, and I've always had to deal with um, wanting to like have birthday parties at my house. I know I'm a weird 18 year old who I'm still like, oh, I want a birthday party. Um, but I went to private school in Cambridge and a lot of my friends who lived in Northern, like up in Cambridge, Watertown, those areas, more like upper middle class families, um, their parents would never let them come to my house because of where I live. So I wouldn't be able to have my friends over and celebrate my birthday. So that was always really difficult. But um, basically, and then actually only on Tuesday, I was in a class and my professor was talking about how he was trying to find something for, some, for a prop for a show and he was saying that like, oh, I had to find wine bottles and weirdly enough, I found them in Dorchester. I know that's such an oxymoron. And I was just like, I'm sorry, what, what does that exactly mean that it's hard, for, like that wine that's like, has a like classification connotation of like this classy thing. Why is that so weird to find in a place that I call my home and a place that I have lived for my entire life? I don't understand that. So I do actually have a question. Um, my question is, how can I help to dispel those sort of connotations about my community? Because I know that my community has all of these wonderful things about it, but that's never what gets recognized. It's always the random, like the acts of violence or the poverty, that's what always gets focused on in Dorchester. So I want to know ways that I can possibly um, try to help people understand that there are better and more important things in our community. Great. Let's have um, one person answer that, then we'll go back over here, because you may have answers to that question too. Who would like to answer the question? You don't have to, they, they can too. I mean, I think you're doing it, for one thing. Um, you're, already, you're already doing it. I mean, just obviously, you're, you're able to speak to this crowd, you're able to um, tell your story. I mean, that's an important story, that whole story about the, the wine, that's totally something that I relate to myself, just in terms of the stereotypes of neighborhoods. But I also want to say that I, I think we have to tell all of the stories, too. I know there was a lot of like backlash when the Boston Globe recently did a spotlight series on Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood. And um, there were certain things about that spotlight series that I thought were just really good, and that it was about time people were focusing on some of this stuff. And I know that a lot of the victims' families, they want some attention for what, what's, you know, so what, some of the affliction that's gone on there. But we have to balance it also with you know, the fact that people in Dorchester are living wonderful lives too. I mean, Dorchester, I hate to, you know, not to betray my Southie roots, but I love Dorchester so much. And, um, and I'm always, actually, that's where I stay when I'm in Boston all the time. And, <clears throat> and you hear people arguing for both in Dorchester. People that are saying, we need more attention to the violence going on in the streets, and then other people are saying, well, that's, how, that's all we ever hear about is the violence in the streets. So we need to hear all of it, and we need to tell all of our stories. That's great, thank you. Over here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy Robinson. I run an organization called Citizens for Safety. I'm proud to say oh, that got two board members up here. Courtney, <laughs> Courtney Gray's on our board, and Michael, hello. Found I think you helped founders, to yeah. found the organization <laughs> yeah. that I, uh, I now uh, oversee. Um, I want to address this to the journalism professors and students um, in the room. I see some of the students with their little journalism notepad, so I know you're here. Um, and I want to tell, make my comment by telling a story. About 10 years ago, a young man was shooting, uh, playing basketball with his father in, uh, in his, um, on, on the court at home that he had, and uh, someone came up and shot him in the leg. Uh, it, this was Buffalo, New York, and he survived, but the bullet ended his basketball playing career. And the Buffalo News, which is the leading newspaper, did a very interesting and unorthodox thing. They reported on the shooting, they reported on the arrest that was made of the young man, um, his last name was Bostic, and he had several felony convictions. And then they went a step further and they actually did a three-part series on the source of the gun. They asked, where does a five-time felon get a hold of a handgun? And traced it all the way back to a gun dealer, notorious gun dealer who was in cahoots with the gun uh, manufacturer and had sold thousands of cheaply made uh, handguns to um, girlfriends 
of uh, these uh, uh, guys who then went on to sell the guns on the street. Um, it's, it's not an unusual case in that this happens on the streets of U.S. cities every day. What is unusual about it is that this enterprising journalist asked, where did that gun come from? And so I implore all of you students, all of you teachers, it's something very proactive we can do um, to remind uh, viewers that these guns aren't falling from the sky. They're not, these kids aren't born with these guns in their hands. Somebody is providing it to them and we need to go right back to the source. I you know, Courtney, you can speak somewhat to this. Um, it's a very important question that's not being asked by media and it needs to be asked. Thank you. Right over here, come join us. Hi, my name is Celia. I'm a junior theater education major here at Emerson. And um, I have an interest in working with juvenile offenders. So what Taisha said about them being the audience we need in these places was really personal. Um, I have a question. I have it kind of, my <laughs> thoughts assembled here. So hold on one second. Nerd. Technology. Um, all right, this is for the panel. Kind of bringing it back to social media. Um, during the Boston Marathon bombings, and the events that transpired, there was this mass call for people not to post tweets or Facebook statuses about what they heard on like public police scanners, and there was a lot of misinformation on social media, but the majority of the misinformation seemed to be coming from major news sources. Hmm. Um, I mean, there are obviously drawbacks to the immediacy of reporting when it comes to social media, Ooh. but there's also a big grassroots aspect for getting lesser known stories and things that the major media may not report on sort of out into the world. So what's your opinion on social media as a reporting tool for those kind of things in light of recent tragedies. Is there one person that'd like to take that? I love the social media. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get the voice a lot of opinions. Like, I, an example about selective journalism or mm -hmm. reporting. Uh, they had me reading the names of the victims. So I decided one day, <laughs> uh, there were so many kids killed that day, not only at Columbine, I wanted to include other kids and make the world aware that there's other victims and we should give them the same attention as we was giving the victims at Columbine. So I start to read out a list of other children, you know, that had been killed that same day or that same week. And that was never televised because they selected not those children was more important than the children in the inner city schools. Mm -hmm. So social media, I went to them and I posted the, the children's names. And I do that, you know, when they come up and select who they want to report, there's other families that's hurt, there's other innocent victims that's been lost. And so I feel like if we get everybody the same attention that maybe we can let the world know there's innocent victims every day, lives being lost because of ignorance. So, but I love the social media because I get to post every day. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Thank you, and thank you for that very I, important I, I question. I think it's, it's an important part of it, but I just, yeah. um, it, like it can add to what we do in organizing. But I, like, I think a few years ago, some people were thinking that it might take the place of that face-to-face -face organizing that we need to do, but it can never do that. There's nothing like in-person, face-to-face community organizing, grassroots level. It can, only, it can help it maybe, but it should never. Um, sometimes people will um, be part of an awareness raising campaign on social media. Awareness raising is important, but sometimes people, if they post a ribbon that's a certain color for like you know, breast cancer awareness month or something, then you feel like you did your thing. But we need to get out there. We need to be in the streets. We need to be talking to each other in person. Great. All right, I'm going to jump over here exactly. um, and ask folks to keep your comments. You're doing great, actually, uh, to keep them short and concise so I can bounce back and forth. This has been great. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Tushani. Um, I'm actually a journalism student here, and I'm from Dorchester as well. I think one of the reasons um, there's a disparity in the media when it comes to um, urban communities as far as violence is concerned is because the newsrooms are not as diverse as the communities that they cover. I think that's a really big issue. Um, 
I want to say, Michael, I'm excited you're here. I'm glad you guys are all here. But I actually just finished your book a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things I loved about your book, and Courtney, you actually mentioned this, um, how violence in the urban community is more publicized than anywhere else. And what I loved about your book, Michael, was that you kind of uncovered that. It was like the same things that happen in the urban community from violence, um, people living in the projects where it's 10 of them in a two bedroom apartment. You made it realistic and you made it known that it wasn't just a color thing. It was more so of a class. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. You want to say something as well? OK. Can I ask a favor, though? Uh, wait, wait. We have a person that is going to speak. It's about yes. her. Oh, that's perfect. OK. There's an introduction for you. Go right ahead. Well, I guess just before this lady speaks, could you guys just give her a big round of applause? This young lady right here. Yeah. that violence is bad for the world and I would just want to ask that um how can all the kids help 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 change the world and make the world a better place are you going to tell them who your mommy is but before, before I ask them young lady what's your name Samadhi Samadhi what do you think That's my what do you think kids should do I think we should I think we should like um Try to tell people that violence is bad and they shouldn't do it again. That's great. Thank you. It's a great question. I'm Kelly. That. <laughs> Kelly, that's, that's her daughter. Taish, is that your daughter? That's my daughter, yes. Wow. She's incredible. Thank you. She's incredible. I think she's asking a very serious question. What is yeah, the role is. that young people can play? What do you think? What are some things that she and her friends and the rest of young people can be doing? I know a lot of you work with young people on this issue. I can give a, an example, a story. Um, when we were doing the gun buyback programs in Boston, one of the things that um, a group of young people your age in uh, Gallivan, on, on Gallivan Boulevard, uh, what's the development there called? It's called Gallivan, up in Gallivan. Uh, a group of young people your age in Dorchester, they wanted to hold, they, they didn't want to be left out of this citywide discussion, this conversation about getting guns off the street. So they decided to hold a toy gun turn in and they organized this all on their own. They got local businesses to donate peaceful, like nonviolent toys and things that they could give to kids your age who would t turn in their toy guns. We know toy guns don't kill people, but it's making a powerful statement that we don't need to be, cult you know, we don't need to promote the culture of violence. So the young people organized this whole thing and they all stood up as leaders. What you're doing now is standing up as a leader and it's about that. It's about our leadership coming from the people who are most impacted by this stuff. And that's all of us. I just want to say one more thing. We just shouldn't just use guns because it's a bad, it's a bad thing to do and it's not helping our world. Thank you, oh. Thank you so much. Great. I think I can remember that for the rest of my life. Okay. Wow. All right. To the left. Hello. Okay. Um, my name is Marcel. I am originally from Cameroon, which is in West Africa, but I grew up in Maine, which is a state that's five hours away from here. Uh, I've never really experienced um, hatred or racism until I entered my freshman year of college, which was a long time ago. I'm a graduate student right now, first year, uh, studying journalism. Um, and it really made me question my identity. And it was actually um, a, a black female who was from Boston. Um, I went up to her and I said, hi, my name is Marcel. It's a pleasure to meet you. And she said, you ain't black. Um, so, you know, we talk about the media depicting, you know, black people being, you know, uh, bad and worthless and whatnot, but then you have to wonder, where is this really coming from? Where is this rooted back? How is this young woman looking at me saying that I'm not black when clearly <laughs> I am probably darker than she is? Um, so my question really is, you know, what does it mean to be black? I think it means beauty. In my opinion. What black means? Yes. <laughs> oh, black means pride, sweetie. Black means uh, pride. Black means strong. 
uh, spiritual. Black means togetherness. That's what black means. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tiela Grimes. I'm actually a, K first of all, first and foremost, thank you for having this conversation. This is something I've always dreamed about, things I've done since 16 years old. I've actually, my background is in a youth media literacy program. So for me, at 16, media being taught to me at that age around race and sex, because at the time it was at the YWCA Boston, and they focused around eliminating racism and sexism. So to have a youth program cater to young people, 13 to 19 years old, and educating them about the media, I learned a lot about myself at a very young age, which led me to be at Lesley University now, working towards my master's in media literacy education and urban youth development, specifically media and urban youth. I say all this because this whole conversation is important. And like the young lady addressed earlier today, I really do wish there was more young people who are living in these urban communities in a room like this. They don't know what a room like this look like. They don't be invited to a room like this. They might not even come because of the area that it's located in. But all of that stems from certain things that media may perpetrate in the media as far as certain races go here, certain people go here. This is an area you're not supposed to. So you're not even open to going somewhere else to explore and to learn another culture, another way, another being, because of certain things that are stemmed on the media. I work for a GED program with dropout students 16 to 24 years old. I've lost students. I've lost a student who was murdered last in 2011. So I deal with young people who have dropped out of school, feel left out, still dealing with issues and trying to obtain their education, find a job and trying to go on to college, but still in the midst of dealing with funerals left and right, losing friends, losing family members, burying family members in the midst of trying to build themselves up, but then turn on television and turn around and have your whole community, including yourself, broken down. It makes it seem like it's an isolated issue. Media as much as I love it, it has its good and its bad. You can use it to empower and you can use it to disempower. When looking at urban communities of color, most likely sometimes it's usually to disempower a community. And then, like the young lady said earlier today, my friends don't want to come to the neighborhood that I live on or live in because of the violence or the way that it's perpetuated. Thank you for having this conversation, but it also makes me think about um, a college where on the other side of Ruggles, it's uh, considered Roxbury, but on the other side of Ruggles, it's also considered Boston, but it's right across the street. So it makes me think about some of the things and some of the areas and some of the institutions and some of the, so how we are structured and how can we then incorporate more people that look like me into that conversation without making it feel like they're being tokenized. lower the microphone oh, just yes. like your daughter did um, <laughs> you know um, hi I'm Susie I'm a senior theater education major at Emerson and first off I want to say thank you for um, inspiring me to do better for my future students I right now promise to do my best to make sure that none of my students are ever called any word close to that in my classroom um, and no, none of my students ever call someone that in my classroom. Um, I want to talk about um, like how so often when this, the answer to like how do we solve this gun violence, how do we solve this epidemic, the answer is often that people say is increase policing um, and more police. And I just don't think that's right. Um, as a queer woman, um, it's so often that police are the ones who perpetrate uh, violence against people of color and queer people and poor folks um, and I want to know how to dispel that myth that increased policing means increased safety. Yes. You know and I hope you know I would do something a little out of the box here. I actually think the next person is about to come speak might have an opinion on that <laughs> and also could offer his opinion. Is that okay? I bet you have some Jamal Crawford and then if anybody else wants to answer. Uh, peace, everybody. My name is Jamal Crawford from the Blackstonian uh, from Roxbury. Uh, so on policing, yeah, it's definitely uh, not an untruism that uh, more police equals more safety. Uh, recent report by the Malcolm X grassroots movement, when I first got it, it was 
uh, every 40 hours, uh, a black or brown person is uh, hurt, killed, assaulted uh, by a police officer. Then about a week later, it was uh, every 38 hours, then it was 36. Now it's down to like, I think 22 is where it's at now. So uh, just to put that in perspective, that there is a nationwide epidemic, and I was just mentioning this to somebody that I know today, um, you know, People would say, well, you know, policing a big city is difficult. Da, 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 da. Has anybody in here heard of the, the little innocent white guy who accidentally got shot by the police? I mean, it just doesn't happen that often. Uh, and then also, too, have you ever heard of the group of black officers who mistakenly shot a white kid? Just doesn't seem to happen. Have you heard of uh, the Asian officers who shot a black Kid. No, that doesn't happen either. Have you heard of the group of female officers that, no, that doesn't happen either. So basically what you have is a problem with white male officers with uh, everybody else. Uh, and they're from the age of uh, rookie to retirement. So uh, it, it, it is a problem, it's an epidemic, it's not something we believe here. And in Boston, we've seen that because when they've increased police and increased police budget, uh, much to, as these people will tell you, while cutting uh, youth employment, summer programs, closing down community centers, closing schools and all this, uh, that, uh, and in Roxbury, well, we got that brand new spiffy police station that cost $14 million to build. Uh, so I could go on and on on that, but it's, it's, it's a load, all right? Um, my point uh, was, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the work of the Blackstonian, but we're the people who, you know, kind of came up with that comparison of the marathon uh, to, you know, what happens in our communities every day. So the whole thing and the, and, the, and, the, and the thought behind that was something that I think is important for students of media, uh, whether that is print, broadcast, or what have you, which is just something to keep in the back of your mind, which is the devaluation of black and brown life, where just... Black and brown life just ain't worth what white life is. And we could see it if you say, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. He might be a little out of pocket there. Well, let's evidence it, right? So let's look at uh, natural disaster that happens to white people, hurricane, tornado, flood, right, to white people. And it's a big to-do. Black people, you're going to have to tread water till we get there. And we're a little busy. So you have the Katrina versus all the other tragedies that have happened that have been responded to quickly, correct? Then you have the incident of missing children. Little white, Heather Sue, right? She goes missing, stop the presses, world stops spinning on its axis, right? And there has to be an instantaneous national response. Uh, little Shaniqua, little Tyrone goes missing, mm, not so much, right? And then we look at the violence, where in instances of violence, whether it's these mass shootings that occurs, you know, the Auroras, the, 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 the Columbines, the, the uh, New Towns, and so on, which are clearly tragic and didn't only just have white victims, by the way. But that even shows you even more so that if a group of 30 people get shot and a couple of them are black, eh, uh, yeah, wasn't that a tragedy? What happened to these people here? So they even pluck out the victims who are the most uh, 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 sexy, if you will, for the media to use. Uh, and the black, like, like, does anybody remember the black kid who got killed from Columbine? Right. But see, uh, a lot of us are focused on this one thing. So I just say that to say that uh, in the back of our mind, we have to recognize the devaluation of black and brown life. And the real reason that I believe that it doesn't get the same attention is because we haven't had a national conversation about an honest conversation about this race thing that basically says that black life is here. Right. And white life is here, much like different cuts of meat or different uh, brands of juice. You can get the dollar juice or you can get the $3.50 juice. We're devalued and it's a problem and I'll, and I'll leave with this. The other thing i say as an activist working in it, oftentimes what strikes me, and I'm outside, I'm not a nonprofit, I'm not a, I don't have a job, I'm, I'm, I'm a community guy. Okay, from H Block, by the way. Uh, so in our conversations, talking to the police, talking to the mayor, what is often so puzzling to me is how the ones who say that they care the most and are supposed to be the ones who are trying to stop the violence, oftentimes when you have a proposal or a plan or an agenda, they're the number one people in the way. 
Okay, so that it is my belief, the conclusion that I've come to nationally and here, is that Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis, uh, this is my opinion, many in this room will not agree, uh, Mayor Thomas M. Menino, do not care and do not wish to stop the violence. And in fact, that continuation of the violence actually is what makes money. Okay, and there's a lot of uh, other people who are in that, the nonprofits and whatnot, who suck up that little uh, sorrow dollar, right, off of pain and misery. So, there, you know, there's money to be made off of death and destruction. And once again, if you look at the medical industry, do they want to cure you or do they want to sell you a pill that you can be on forever? And by the way, you might get diarrhea and runny nose and da da da. This is very tall, and I'm tall. Good evening, everyone. My name is Farai, and I am the street theater artistic director for Project Hip Hop in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Hip Hop stands for Highways into the Past and History, Organizing and Power. I also do work in my own um, DBA. I was moved to come up here because there was a question that was asked, this idea of blackness. Blackness is a socio-political position. It is not the color of your skin. It is not just defined by the color of your skin. And I'm sure she was referring to cultural competence. And we could have a deeper conversation about that. I'm sure that she was dealing with some internalized depression, and I do theater of the oppressed work, so I know quite a bit about internalized depression. I would also raise that I'm pretty sure that that is not the only time that Cameroon or a Cameroonian has suffered racism. The mere fact that it was named Cameroon, right? So we're here talking about the media, and I just want to raise that, albeit the media must be um, really looked at in terms of how they frame things, but I would ask us to look deeper. How are we framing things? Because at the source of the media, as people have alluded to, are human beings. Those human beings why were raised by other human beings. There is a mass culture in this world that we all are a part of. And I would say that we need to look at how we are framing things. What do those of you who call yourself journalists or media people think about the responsibility of the masses to frame and shape your own stories? I'm a storyteller. I use theater. A jele fama, jele fama, which some French person called the griot. We tell our own stories. So I do hold the media responsible for the framing that they do, but I hold us responsible as well. And I would just ask that that's something that we consider. And that's all. Sure. Um, hi, you guys. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Laura Onyenaho, and I'm also a graduate student here at Emerson College um, in the journalism program. So Marcel is my, my comrade, yes. Also my African, yeah, because I'm Nigerian too. So I would like to bounce off your daughter because I, I live in Lowell, Massachusetts, and I do a lot of youth service work for the um, Lowell Community Health Center, as well as the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Lowell and the United Teens Education um, Equality Center. So we do this thing called Dance for Peace, where you know we bring our youth together on the stage and we bring local talents to the area too. We, and we have a theme of nonviolence, and we have singers, dancers, 
actors and everybody come together to just spread the word in our community about, you know, keeping the peace. Um, we do have, provide scholarship at the end of the program to, you know, as an initiative for students who are seniors in high school to have this money to go to college. So it's not a lot, but it's something that would give them that push. A lot of our youth that I've worked with are highly um, participant in their you know, civic engagement. That's what we want to you know, promote um, for our youth. And we want them to do that respectively and not in a, a rowdy um, behavior, because I know how passionate they are. Um, and for you guys, and you know, to bounce off your daughter, like what can our youth do in terms of civic engagement, civic participation with our city government? Because eventually, I mean, it is a community issue, I believe in things working from the bottom up. But I mean, eventually you're gonna have to work up there with people who do create laws. You know, so what can we do to work with our city government? And you know, and it's gonna go up national, so President Obama, like what do you see us happening thus far in terms of legislation for our, like city government up for starting with our youth? Thank you. Thank you. Would one person like to address that? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, get that. Get that. They see me all the time. I don't I live in Boston. Give me, give me. Um, what can happen is and I'm quite active with the political parties. Great. Um, you are the people, you are the voter, you are the government, in other words. It's a start, you start writing letters, making those telephone calls to uh, your representatives, I guarantee you, they will do something. Now, it might not be the end result what you want, but they will make a call to somebody else and action will get started. So you have to start at the bottom and go all the way to the top and be persistent because I always get things done. It might not be what I want, but it's better than it was. Yeah, great, Thank So you. be persistent, make sure, write the newspapers, get some attention, get other people, put it on Facebook. <laughs> Great. But Thank you do so something. It, more matters they get, they move. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a hotline that you can call, and they tell you who your representative is. Just give them the district. They tell you everything. They need to learn that too, because I mean, <laughs> they they learned so much about the national government. But you know, who is your you know your mayor of Lowell? You they know they, they don't know. Have a yeah. to the, I mean, the White House. Yes. You call the White House. I guarantee it's going to be. Listen to, and they're gonna call your congressman or your old state representative to get an investigation going. So there's two numbers. I wish I had them with me, yeah. but if it's that serious, it's someone you can call. There, there are hotlines on every level of the government. And, and actually, that's a perfect segue yes. to closing out this evening. I want to share a few actual things that one can do. Um, from this perch. We've heard a lot about issues tonight around the race and class disparities around ending gun violence. Uh, just four things, because hopefully the role of the Alma Lewis Center um, and also of community people is to come together and help us be better advocates on these issues. Uh, the first is, uh, many of you may know at the State House right now, they are debating and deciding to put together legislation that would control the flow of guns, that would address questions around youth jobs and education. It's important, I think, for people to be informed about those issues and be involved. Tuesday is what? Tuesday is election day. And in the city of Boston in particular, and in other jurisdictions all around the state, there are big races for mayor. And I think one of the most important things one can do is research the positions of the mayors to be on their positions on this issue. And I'm sure there are uh, different websites and different ways that you can find that out. Call those up, call their offices and ask the question yourself. Also, I want to point you to a couple of other opportunities. Um, the president, many of you know, President Pelton has made this issue a critical issue for our entire college, and he's taken a lot of leadership on it. If you go to our website at Emerson College, he's actually created a gun violence resource center. 
not only for our benefit as a community, but for other academic institutions and colleges to look at. So whether you're a part of the Emerson community or another institution, we hope that you will share that information. The other opportunity for more discussion is tomorrow at 6 p.m., there's gonna be a restorative justice mixer held at the Bright Family Screening Room Lobby, which is at the Paramount Center on Washington Street, not the theater I've been told, but the center. Um, and there will be people dedicated to trauma response and conflict resolution there talking and, and coming together. And Arts Emerson has that information on their Facebook if you're interested. Also, stay in touch with the Alma Lewis Center. We want to know who you are. Do you want to stay engaged with these issues? I have cards on the table here if you want to come up at the end and introduce yourself so we can be in touch with you. But I really think that it, it is something, I think you all said this well, it's not about just the media or you know, just all of us have a role to play in addressing these issues. I want to also take a moment before we close. This is an, act, an event that's part of a series of incredible theater. As you know, Columbinus is being shown here. And I want to just acknowledge, because they are putting a spotlight on this question of gun violence, uh, the artists who have been associated with that. Would you please stand up and be recognized? The artists who have been a part of that production or people who have helped with that production, can we just acknowledge them and thank them <coughs> for bringing this to the Also at Arts Emerson's website and social media, you can find out more about this production. It's very powerful. I heard it's very intense. And what's very interesting and unique about it is you'll hear what's happened. There's a rendition of what uh, the families are going through right now. Um, I want to first thank our panelists and have people acknowledge you. Thank you so much. You are powerful activists. You are powerful women and men. We thank you so much for sharing your stories. It's not you know, very easy to talk about these issues. I really, really thank you and appreciate what you were willing to share. I want to also uh, thank you, our audience, for coming out and sharing some very, very um, important comments and things that I know may not have been easy to say in the Majestic Theater with all of these people. It can be quite intimidating, but beautiful in here. Um, and I want to just end on a quote. The center, the Emma Lewis Center, is named after Emma. And she said something that I take to heart. And she said, her hope was, when I leave here, the body of my work will be all these wonderful people out there in the world doing great things. And I really believe that we can do th these kind of great things together. Um, this audience, the Emerson community, our panelists, all of us in Boston, around the world, the arts, culture, and communication community, we can shape the hearts and minds of people on this issue. We alone as individuals, we as a collective, we as future and current responsible and ethical journalists, and as people who care about dignity and humanity, because we can achieve peace. It's not a hopeless endeavor, it's a human endeavor. And I just wanna thank everybody for coming out and being a part of this conversation, and I hope that you will take action. I hope that you will talk to each other and mill around, stay in touch with the center, and also can, you know, converse with some of our panelists as we stay here this evening. Can you please give a round of applause and thank yourself for coming out? Please have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Stay around a little bit, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.